So hi everyone. For uh, anyone who I haven't met before, my name is uh, Ryan Brecker. I'm chair of the Luke Easter Saber Chapter and uh, treasurer for the Rochester Baseball Historical Society. And uh, we've been trying to host Zooms roughly once a month on various baseball topics. And uh, tonight, very pleased to have a program on uh, visualizing baseball data. Uh, we have uh, two, uh, two presentations tonight. Um, first, we're going to have um, Ethan Singer talk about his uh, Twitter account, um, Umpire Scorecards, um, which is one of my favorite Twitter follows. And it uh, really gives a nice breakdown of um, how home plate umpires have called each game. Um, and he's going to go through um, how he presents that data and kind of the process behind that. And our uh, second talk is going to be on Steve and Ben Dertinger, who are um, Luke Easter Saber chapter members, who are going to be talking about the use of a program called ToxPy uh, to visualize uh, player performance data. Um, at the end of each talk, we'll have a few minutes for uh, Q&A uh, for that talk in particular. And um, if we have time at the end, we can uh, have some general conversation. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Ethan um, to talk to us about umpire scorecards. Sounds good. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, share my screen. Uh, let me just get the presenter here. Okay. Uh, does everyone see the um, the presentation? Yes, I see it. Do you see my is my uh, is my little notes thing there too, or do you just see the presentation? We see your notes also. It looks like. Hmm. Okay, that's fine. I don't need notes. Okay. Um, I will, uh, I'll just get started then. So, uh, my name is, uh, Ethan Singer and today I'll be talking about, uh, my platform. I guess you could call it umpire scorecards or ump scorecards as it's known uh, more online. So first I figured I'd just go over uh, what is umpire scorecards. So umpire scorecards is an online platform, which at the moment consists of uh, a Twitter and a dedicated website, which hosts the raw data uh, behind the Twitter account. And it's a platform which tracks and analyzes um, MLB umpire performance uh, in every game uh, for every team uh, for about the last, I guess, uh, pretty much a full season now. Uh, so for each game, I look at the accuracy of the umpire, which is just what percent of calls did they call correctly? I look at the consistency of umpires, which is, you know, for two given pitches in the same location, are they calling them the same thing or are they calling them differently? And finally, I'm looking at favor, which is just, uh, you know, over the entire game, did the incorrect calls benefit one team more than they benefited the other, et cetera. So I launched the Twitter in August of 2020, and I now have uh, about 90,000 followers close to it. And I launched the site just uh, pretty recently, earlier this month, June 1st. And I have about uh, 600 people that visit the site every day or something like that uh, along those lines. And so at the bottom here, what you see is uh, on the left, uh, an example of one of the graphics that I, that I upload. Uh, you know, it says what the game was, when it was played, et cetera. But more importantly, it shows you the accuracy, what team was benefited, the consistency, and also a strike zone plot of all of the missed calls in the game, along with sure, which yeah. of those missed calls uh, had the largest impact on the game. <laughs> and then on the bottom right, you can see just a snapshot of, uh, of the website. That's the games page where you can just see data on every game that was played uh, over the year. So just a little bit of history on umpire scorecards uh, before we get into the more of the, the how it works is uh, so I first started analyzing umpires during the 2019 postseason, although it was not under the name umpire scorecards yet. I was just filling in uh, templates that I had built on Adobe Illustrator uh, by hand and then posting them onto Reddit, which is another social media site. And so, you know, every day I would go to the Baseball Savant website, press the download button, uh, you know, read through the data, scroll through it on Excel or use a little uh, Python script that I had to you know, figure out how many taken strikes there were, uh, what percent were incorrect, et cetera. And then I would fill in all of those numbers by hand on this template, and then I would post them to Reddit. So what you see here on the bottom left is actually the very first 
uh, graphic that I ever made analyzing umpires. I dug up uh, into the archives to find it. Um, and it's, it's quite a bit different than, uh, than the graphics that I use now. Uh, there's way too much text. I'll admit it's not the, not the, not the prettiest thing I've ever made. Um, but you can see, you know, it's, it's the, the ideas were there and, uh, in the middle is sort of the second iteration of graphics that I had. And you can see the introduction of those, the, the sort of high chart looking things. And, uh, those are still present in the graphics today. And finally, the third iteration, I introduced the, uh, the strike zone plot. Uh, which is definitely a, a crucial part of the graphics today. And then just to finish up the history, uh, like I said, in, in August of last year, I realized that I could automate this entire process so that I wouldn't have to you know, do anything by myself really anymore. Uh, so what you can see on the left is what the scorecards looked like last year uh, when I first automated it. And then on the right is what they look like today. So that's an example of a recent graphic from something like a week ago. Um, you can see that uh, from this year to last year, I put more emphasis on the overall favor. Uh, it was sort of relegated to the bottom of the screen last year, uh, but people thought that wasn't uh, necessarily a good spot for it. And I also measured, um, I added a measure of consistency, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, and added this established strike zone, which is uh, the part of the strike zone that's the, the red sort of box. Uh, but again, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more later when, uh, when we go through the process. So uh, the first step in all of this uh, is, is not even really uh, have to do with me, but it's just that the games are played and the data is recorded uh, using Hawkeye tracking systems. Um, and so around 3 a.m. every morning, give or take, uh, unfortunately, many hours, the data is uploaded uh, to this website called Baseball Savant, which is really great, has a lot of um, baseball related data. So they upload the data at 3 a.m. So that's step one. Uh, and then step two is I wake up and I press run. I press this little green button and the, the program runs. And so this second step is that the data is then downloaded from Baseball Savant using a Python library called Pi Baseball, which is really great if you've never used it before. It lets you access all sorts of data um, about pitchers and hitters and umpires, et cetera. And I also uh, download data from my website using a Python library called FTP lib, uh, if you're curious. And I download all of this onto my machine so that I'll be able to uh, look through it and uh, calculate all the, all the metrics that I want. And then so from there, I have step three, which is that I actually loop through each of the games. So that starts with breaking up all of the previous day's data uh, into individual games because I do this on a daily basis. So for example, this morning, it pulled all the games from last night and uh, yesterday afternoon. And then it loops through each of the games one by one. And for each of those games, it does some stuff like I calculate all of the metrics that I use, and then I make the graphic, and then I tweet it. And then I finally, at the end of this, uh, update my website, which hosts all of this data. Uh, so on these steps specifically, the first 3.1, is that I calculate the metrics. Uh, so in those I have accuracy, uh, favor and consistency, like I talked about before. Uh, so more specifically on accuracy, that's what you see on the left uh, portion of the screen. I put a little uh, red box around it here. So each pitch uh, during a game is assigned a probability that it was a strike uh, given its reported location. So where the computer says it was horizontally and vertically. Um, it also looks at the top and bottom of the strike zone because, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, the, while the left and right side of the strike zone are determined by the uh, width of home plate, the top and the bottom are not set. It's not in the rule book. It has to do with how the batter is standing, where their elbows are, and where their knees are, uh, which means that, you know, depending on how somebody's standing, a pitch can either be a strike or a ball, even if it's in the same location. So that's really you know, important to consider when you're looking at whether a pitch was a strike or not. And then I also have uh, some information on potential error within the tracking system itself. So it's been reported to have uh, uh, an average error of less than a quarter of an inch, uh, but even still I have a little bit of a, a margin of error so that I include some you know, probability in, in whether or not uh, the pitch was actually a strike or not given, given the amount of error. And then so from there, I can say that a pitch is uh, considered incorrectly called if it falls under two different categories. Either the probability that it was a strike is greater than 90% and it was called a ball, 
Uh, so that's, you know, uh, I'm trying to find a, yeah, there are some good examples of that on the graphic uh, down below the ones in red, or excuse me, the ones in green. I'm pretty sure they're a strike, but they were called balls. Or the probability of being a strike is less than 10%, but it was called a strike. So those are the ones in red. It's definitely not a strike. It's definitely a ball, but it was called a strike. So those are definitely incorrect as well. And then so from there, I say that the overall accuracy is just the total number of correct calls divided by the total number of calls overall. That's how I arrive at accuracy. Uh, and then so after that is the favor, which is uh, what's reported in the middle here. So that has to do with uh, run expectancy, uh, which you might have heard before in a context that has to do with uh, bases and outs. Uh, so essentially, there are eight different uh, potential orientations for the bases. So you know, bases empty, man on second, bases loaded, second and third, et cetera. There are eight different possible combinations. And there are three different amounts of outs that you can have in an inning, either zero, one, or two. So that makes 24 uh, different, I guess, combinations of outs and bases that you can have. And so there's a popular metric called run expectancy, which looks at how many runs would we expect a team to score from each of those 24 uh, combinations. But I was more concerned with uh, you know, looking at what is a team, how does a team's run expectancy change, you know, given a specific ball or strike call. So not only do you have to look at who's on base and how many outs there are, but you also have to look at uh, what the count is. Uh, so when you include count, you actually have 288 different uh, possible scenarios because there are uh, 12 different counts, you know, 0, 0, 1, and 0, 0, and 1, full count, etc. There are 12 different of those. Uh, and then so from there, I calculated how many team, how many runs a team is expected to score from each of those 288 positions. And then the last step is looking at from each of those positions, what new position will you be in if a ball is called or if a strike is called? So most of those are pretty easy. If it's, you know, base is empty, there's nobody on base and the count is zero, zero. If a strike is called, it goes to 0 and 1. But if a ball is called, it goes to 1 and 0. That's fairly simple. And it's you know, pretty easy to find uh, what the difference in run expectancy is. But some of them are a little bit more complicated. If the bases are loaded and there's three balls, then an extra ball call uh, means the count goes back to 0 and 0, uh, except you've scored a run now because you walked in a runner. Or if there's two outs and there's two strikes, a strike call means that the inning is over and your run expectancy goes uh, back down to zero. So obviously, there are you know, a few more considerations that you have to look at. And then, so on the bottom here, I have this, uh, I guess, spreadsheet looking thing, which says uh, what the value of any given missed call is in any one of these scenarios. So you can see that the most impactful missed call is when the bases are loaded and it's a full count and there are no outs. Uh, so that's in the top right corner. Uh, but most of the, you know, really important calls happen with a 3-2 count, which makes sense because, you know, a strike ends the at-bat versus a, a, a ball uh, makes it a walk. So those are the really important ones, but you know, even some of the less important ones, they're still worth almost a run in terms of value, which is, uh, which is obviously a lot. And then so for each uh, incorrect call, I find how much it was worth. And then I sum those for all of the incorrect calls over the game, which is how I determine uh, which team was favored uh, over the other. And then so finally, I'm looking at uh, overall consistency of the umpire, which starts with finding uh, what I call the established strike zone. Uh, it's determined by finding uh, the scientific word for it is the convex hole, or the technical term is the convex hole of every strike. But essentially, it just means uh, what is the like outermost area of all of these of all of these strikes. So from there, I say that any ball that is inside this established strike zone is considered inconsistent with what has been called uh, previously. And then so from there, I just say that the consistency is the percent of balls that are outside of the established strike zone. Uh, so you want a higher overall consistency, which means a greater percent of balls were not inside the established strike zone. Uh, if a ball is inside, you'd consider it inconsistent. So those are the three uh, main aspects that I report. Uh, so then after calculating those, I move on to, ooh, sorry, I move on to building the graphic. Um, so that starts with, uh, generating actually individual images for each of the metrics. So for example, the overall accuracy metric gets its own little image, which you can see here. The favor one gets all 
graphics have been Um, I think we have a little connection issue with you, Ethan. Let's see, I can't tell. Sometimes if you turn off your camera, you'll have better audio quality. Yes. It's like Ethan's still here. See if we can, uh... yep, he's off mute. So I think it's just a uh, little bit of connection lag on Ethan's part. So um, give him a sec. Hi, can anyone hear me? Oh, you're back, Ethan. Hi, I moved to a uh, hopefully better connected spot of my. Okay, so um, in talking about the uh, the tweets themselves, so, uh, just to make sure people can still hear me, correct? Yep, I got you. Great. Okay, so after the. Uh, are uh, plotted, which was back on, um, sorry, back on this screen after I finished making the graphics, I then tweet them out called tweet, which a uh, use cases like uh, media and traffic and then uh, Ethan, your audio is still cutting out. Hmm. Yeah, you're still in and out a little bit, Ethan. Um, hmm. I'm not exactly sure. I'm <laughs> okay. Seem to have you back right now. So. Um. All right. Well, I guess I'll continue. And if there's another problem, I can. Uh, there's another place I can move to. Okay. Yep. Nope. I think you're you're sounding a bit stronger now. So give it a, give it a go. Great. Sounds good. Um, so a, a fun little a fun little anecdote is that when I first uh, started tweeting the graphics, I would get flagged by Twitter as being a uh, as being a bot because I would send them out too quickly, and it uh, it, it thought I was. I, I'm not exactly sure how their algorithm works for finding bot accounts, but it thought that I was one. So still to this day, a part of my program is that the in-between games, it will wait a random amount of time between 30 and 90 seconds uh, to, to, to imitate a human tweeting these out uh, so that hopefully I won't get flagged uh, for being a bot anymore. And I, I'm also hoping that because of the, uh, the amount of followers I have, they, they will be confident that I'm a, I'm a legitimate account uh, and that I'm 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 no longer a bot to them. Thankfully, I have not had that error in uh, in quite a long time. And then, so finally, a little bit more on the technical side. Uh, once I finish tweeting out the game, I actually update all of the data that's on my website. So on my website, I store data on every game that has uh, been called, all of the different teams and how they've been affected, and just general information about each umpire. So after I go through all of these games, I then send that data back up. Uh, to my website so that people can view it there too and then so yeah so that's that's the last step in the uh in the in the in the process and then i just wanted to talk a little bit about uh some some future uh potential updates that i have so one is to uh, automate the entire process so right now 
it's still a bit unfortunate that I have to uh, run it from my own local machine. If, you know, in the, in the ultimate world, this entire thing happens uh, on the internet, in the cloud, and I, I, you know, I never have to press the run button. Uh, another update is that I would like to ultimately improve the consistency metric. Uh, there are a couple you know, more technical issues uh, with it as, as, as it exists now. And also it's a little bit hard to, um, it, it's, it's not really the best metric to use at a, it's, it's really good for a specific game, but it's not very good uh, for the season as a whole. Uh, so improving on that is another uh, next step. And then finally, I would like to add uh, more seasons of data to the, re to the website. Right now, all you can see is uh, the, this current season that we're on right now. Uh, but I would like to obviously add, um, you know, all possible past seasons of data that we have, or uh, yeah, of games that we have uh, data for. And then obviously there are, I'm sure many uh, updates that I could do, but I haven't thought of yet. So I figured, you know, as we're q and aing if anybody has any potential suggestions or ideas, you could, uh, you could share uh, if you would like to. Uh, so that's all I've got today. Uh, if you want to find the Twitter, it's just, you can just look up umpire scorecards and you will probably find the website and, uh, and the Twitter. Um, it's also umpscorecards.com is the website uh, if you're curious. Great, thank you so much, Ethan. Um, so we'll do a few questions to a lead off or a small enough group where you can just unmute yourself and kind of jump in when appropriate. Um, I'll get it started with, uh, so Ethan, what kind, have you gotten any feedback from within the baseball industry? On, um, on your scorecards. Yeah, so um, not any uh, feedback specifically from the league or anything like that, but I certainly have gotten feedback uh, from umpires actually. So when I, when I first started my account, I was using no margin of error in determining whether a, a pitch was incorrectly called or if it was correctly called. So, you know, even if it was right on the edge, but it was, you know, outside the zone and it was called a strike, I would say, oh, you know, that's an incorrect call. And an organization of umpires actually contacted me um, and, you know, wrote a, wrote a, actually a whole article and, and made a YouTube video about it as well, um, about some reasons why that maybe was not such a good idea. And that actually inspired some change that I made on the site. Uh, like I talked about before, now there is some uh, measure of, um, you know, that there is some error in the data. And I now include that uh, in my measure of accuracy, uh, just to make sure that, you know, I'm not penalizing umpires too much. And, and that's, you know, entirely because of feedback that I got uh, from the baseball community. Next one, Steve, you can jump in. I saw you. Yeah. Hi, Ethan. A great presentation. I'm just curious if in the data you're seeing things, you know, like uh, bias around, you know, perceived control pitchers or, you know, the elite pitchers getting more calls their way or vice right. versa, you know, really good hitters with a really good understanding of the zone like Juan Soto. I mean, does he tend to get the benefit of the doubt? Right. Yeah. So, you know. so interestingly, one, one of the, I guess I didn't uh, put this on the presentation, but one of the potential future updates is a, um, you know, per player uh, addition, addition to the site so that you'll be able to look at, you know, how often are different players and different pitchers penalized, but I haven't uh, to the, you know, at this moment done a specific analysis like that, but I've definitely uh, noticed things while I'm, you know, I, I publish these every day, so I inevitably see many of them. And you do sort of tend to pick up on these trends um, of, you know, in really good, in really good, uh, you know, pitching performances, not even for great pitchers in general, but just when any pitcher is performing really well in a game, uh, towards the end of the game, they will begin to get a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. And I've certainly noticed just in my own, you know, anecdotal watching, I'm a Nats fan, so I've seen the Soto bias myself. Um, he tend, you know, people who have a great understanding of the strike zone can tend to have a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. You know, pitchers will be called are more likely to be called strikes or excuse me, balls, because you know the umpire sees, oh well, 
he didn't swing, probably a ball. Uh, so I should probably call it a ball. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Yep. Hey, Ethan. Um, building on that, do you have any information or data on uh, at a team level, say top three or five top and bottom uh, teams that get the favor or or the opposite or are not in favor using? Your yeah, sure. Uh, so that's one of the one of the things that I actually have on the website. So, you know, I can, I, I, I can answer the question, but I'll also put the, uh, the link to the Teams page in the chat uh, so that everybody can explore it if they would like to on their own time. Uh, but just to answer your question, uh, in terms of uh, what percent of games that they are favored, the top teams, the top three teams are Texas, uh, Boston, and Milwaukee. And the bottom three teams are Pittsburgh, uh, LA, the Dodgers, and then uh, Tampa Bay. Uh, but more specifically on like which teams have been, uh, yeah, percent, the percent of games that they've been favored is a little uh, not so representative because, you know, it depends on how the different, how, how it's distributed over different games. Um, but in terms of like who's been helped the most, Texas, uh, again, has been helped uh, by far the most. They've gained almost 17 runs over the year um, for their, uh, you know, in, in terms of this, in terms of this metric while the Dodgers have lost about, about 12 runs. Oh, thanks. Great info. It uh, confirms my, one of my suspicions. <laughs> thanks. Good to hear. I think we had a couple pop up on the chat. Um, one was wondering if, um, if you've noticed anything about whether the zone is generally being expanded to favor pitchers. Got it. So uh, unfortunately, I'm not sure I have a great answer to that. Uh, these are all great, great <clears throat> excuse me, great questions, but I haven't personally looked at, um, you know, whether the zone is expanding. I do know though that, you know, a, a lot of people online um, have been have been doing, uh, you know, similar research to mine. Uh, and I, 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 I seem to remember an article that I read. I'm not sure what it was. Uh, or what, you know, what publication it was in about the zone being expanded. Uh, that's sort of like the, the consensus that, I, that I've read online. Um, but but I'm, I'm not sure I have a too good of an answer for you. Uh, but on the, on the second question that I'm reading here about uh, the age and uh, years of experience for uh, umpires, uh, you know, one of the funny things that has happened with my 15 minutes of fame on Twitter is that there have been sort of uh, pop-up accounts who... Uh, actually like analyze my own data for me, uh, which is, you know, a, a little, a little bit funny. Um, but I saw an interesting project where somebody made a, a graph looking at the um, difference in umpire age and also their overall accuracy and um, age negatively correlated with accuracy, which I think would be uh, most people's intuition that the, that the older umpires, well, that the, really it's that the newer umpires um, tend to be tend to be a bit more accurate, uh, w which is definitely an interesting conclusion. And uh, one of the first articles that I read about umpires, you know, it came out a couple of years ago, uh, came to the same conclusion. So it was definitely nice to be able to see that uh, see that echoed within my own data. Fabulous. All right. Well, we'll um, hold on the Q and A for Ethan right now. Oh, and Ethan, just uh, one more thing. What's um, you're currently an undergrad at Boston University, is that right? Yeah, I'm a rising sophomore at uh, Boston University. Yeah, so I mean, this is this is phenomenal stuff to be doing during your undergrad years. But uh, what are your career aspirations? Uh, that's a good question. Um, right now, my major is uh, computer science and statistics, uh, but I, I actually I'm trying to pursue a uh, a minor in public policy analysis, which I think will be the uh, the ultimate, the, the landing point uh, in the future. All right. And you're a sophomore, you got plenty of time. So, yeah. <laughs> so no pressure with that question. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you so much, Ethan, and um, certainly hope you can stick around. And um, after um, Steve and Ben um, do their presentation, if there's any other questions for Ethan, and we have some time at the end, um, I'm sure he'll be happy to uh, jump back in. Yep, so, great. Yeah, so with that, we'll um, turn it over to uh, Steve and Ben Dertinger for their uh, repurposing of um, Toxify software for uh, baseball data synthesis and visualization. 
Thank you. Can you hear us okay? Yep. So yeah, first I'll say congratulations, Ethan. Really great work. And um, as a post here, 90,000 followers, we have four followers and they're all, <laughs> they're all joining us today. <laughs> Um, a grandmother and some aunts and uncles. So um, I'm just setting the bar a little lower <laughs> for this audience. Uh, I, I'll start out by saying thanks to Ryan for all the great content you've been providing um, over the year, over this pandemic year. It's really been interesting. And uh, Ben and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to your group uh, this evening. Um, it was kind of a father and son you know, over uh, Christmas break data project. Um, ben is a, Ben was a sophomore at Lemoyne. He's transferring to High Point um, come the fall. And instead of strictly business, he's kind of pivoting to a data analytics, um, at least as a minor. So that's just a little background. And we kind of cooked up this, um, COVID project, you might say, just kind of uh, looking for a fun uh, father-son data analytics project. And this is the result. And I guess I'll, before I turn it over to Ben, I'll just um, emphasize the fact that this work is currently uh, being considered for publication at Baseball Research Journal. So we'll get reviews back and we will have an opportunity to revise our paper based on those reviews. But if you have any suggestions or you know, comments that would help us improve this presentation, you know, we'd be uh, really excited to hear from you. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ben. All right, thank you, Dad. Oh, let me, is it, which button is it? Um, let's... Advance. Maybe the space or the answer key. Oh. Yeah, sorry. Technical difficulty. Um, maybe down Are here. Are we just going to have yeah. to go to that every no. time? Yeah. Okay. So um, as my dad mentioned, this is a fun father-son project, and it's kind of fitting coming off of Father's Day. So uh, I'll begin by providing you a brief overview of kind of what we did So, or what we're going to discuss. So I'm gonna begin by giving you a background and introduction to the ToxPy software. I'll then introduce three case studies that, uh, that introduce the various software features and applications, and then offer some conclusions in future directions. So here's the problem. We're drowning in advanced statistics. So I'm sure you've all seen graphs like these and with different technology and advanced or well, with technology advancing everything's being captured from uh the like ball speed is all these different advanced metrics and this is just one example of a fan graphs chart from mike trout one of 21. so this leads me to introduce a partial solution which is toxpy it's a freely available synthesis and visualization program and if you look to the far left image you can see an example of a profile. You can see it bears a strong resemblance to say a pie chart to the direct right. And if you're into video games, you may recognize this graphic from MLB The Show. And yes, even, um, even furthest to the right, Florence Nightingale's rose diagram from the 19th century and her diagram of the cause of mortality in the army in the East. So let me walk you through an anatomy of a ToxPy profile. For one player, six statistics, and take note that this is for one season. So each pie slice denotes a different performance metric. So say, look at the purple slice. That would represent um, batting average, for example, say 280. The distance each pie slice extends from the origin is proportional to a player's performance. So the further extending the pie slice goes, it means the greater the performance. If it's closer to the origin or the center, then it means the player is performing worse in that specific metric. So the width is relative to the, um, 
wait it's it's relative to the um the emphasis the analyst places on it so if it's a wider pie slice it means there's a greater value placed on the specific slice and so if you look to the blue there's less emphasis placed on that specific slice than the red slice yeah Mike. Sorry, the slide's being weird. Oh, there we go. So now what about multiple seasons? Keep in mind what we were looking at before was just over one season, but now we have one player, six statistics, but now over three seasons. So it's important to note here, you can see now there's a lightly color shaded band at the edge of our Toxpy profile. And an example of this, now rather than just 280, we also have a season represented for 300, and 260. So the white line is the average value for the several seasons studied. And this is not as important and not something we want you to necessarily focus on. Rather than focusing on this white average line, it's better to concentrate on this lighter previously mentioned, the periphery, like lightly shaded band at the edge. And this is the 95% confidence okay. interval. And this is the range within the metrics is estimated to occur. So let me talk you through this. So the lightly colored band represents how, um, how consistent or inconsistent a player may be. So if we look to the red colored slice, we'll see they have a very small lightly colored band at the end. So that means that the player is very consistent because all of their data falls within that small band. Whereas if we look to a band or a slice, such as the blue, we'll see it's very large, meaning that data can fall in any of the bigger slice. So this confidence interval helps convey the player consistency and variability. And it, it's a great visualization technique and for measuring model uncertainty as well. So let me walk you through a case study one in a time series of Bryce Harper over the years 2016 through 2019. If you look to the bottom left, you'll see we use three different metrics with the orange being an offensive metric, purple being a base running metric, and the blue being a defensive metric. When you look to the Toxpy profiles we provided, you see in our key, we have these three. And next to it, we have Bryce Harper over all four years, 2016 through 2019, summarized into one, um, one Toxpy profile. <coughs> so, if we look to the right of that, we'll see the individual years where this data comes from. So we'll see 2016, 2017, and I'll point you out to 2018, where in Harper's contract year, there was a severe lack of defense. So we can see where this data comes from in our um, in the bigger picture here, because we'll see that the um, the confidence interval extends all the way from the origin. So because it's slightly colored all the way out, we see this extreme variability. So this is just a great method of visualization because we get to zoom in and see the smaller picture with the individual years while still being able to see the bigger picture here in, um, in a summary profile. So this leads me to case study two in a player versus player comparison over these same 2016 through 2019 years. So I'll give you uh, a little time to look at rank order A and rank order B and see, just take a minute to think how you would rank these players. All right, so who guessed rank order A? That's what talks by output for these specific players. And I just wanna quickly note that we use the same metrics here with, in the top right of the same offensive base running and defensive statistics. So I'll read out the top five for you because I understand it is rather small. We have Trout, Mookie Betts, Yelich, Arnado, and Freeman for the top five, as was the rank order A. So you can read these like a book, top left, or left to right, top to bottom. And another thing I'll point your attention to is we did include a reference average player in the um, second column and then on the bottom row. 
So as you can see, with the average player being so far down, we did include a bunch of quote unquote elite players, but we did include um, some average and some below average for reference. So if you take your attention to the right, you'll see two blown up um, profiles of Yelich and Arnato. So Toxpy assigns a score and a rank to each player, and you'll be able to better visualize these in another um, visualization tool that Toxpy offers in the next slide. So you can see that um, it's not just a pretty picture here. Here's a rank plot, and it's displayed with just a click of the mouse. I'm not going to lose sleep. <laughs> so um, you can see the rankings and the scores are pitted against each other and put into a graph. So it's just the same thing, just displayed in a different way. So by, by now, I'm sure you're wondering, where did we get these weights? How did we decide on, um, like, because we're not the ones outputting this ourselves. We're using ToxPy to get this data. So how well does ToxPy score reflect performance? Well, we used WAR as a ground truth type metric to evaluate the ToxPy score in our modeling decisions. So if you look to our graph of WAR versus ToxPy and the score correlation, you can see that we had an R squared value of 0.85. And this correlation coefficient um, signifies a strong correlation between the two and um, how closely related the two metrics are. So what we consider to be one of the most valuable software features is the unsupervised hierarchical clustering. And this is an unbiased grouping. So it sounds confusing, but when you look at it, it's just different players clustered in different groups. And what we term clades. So if you look to the A cluster, you'll see the quote unquote elite players. If you look to the B, you'll see the league average and you can note the reference average point is included here. And C is below average. So what's also interesting is Mike Trout received his own subclade and he isn't grouped with any of the elite league average or below average. He's in a league of his own here. And this is due to his historically great seasons over 2016 through 2019. And you're able to greatly, it's just a great way to visualize this. Yeah, and different, yeah. So this leads me to performance granularity. So let's take a look at JD Martinez and Mookie Betts. These are two very different players. However, they both ended up in that elite classification. JD Martinez, as you can see from the ToxPy profile, he clearly earns his money at the plate with his offensive being consistently great and leagues above the reference average point. Mookie Betts is overall a very strong player with very consistent um, high performing defensive and base running while still having an amazing um, offense. You can see that because of, um, if I take you back to my very classifications earlier, you can see because of how um, large Mookie Betts' confidence interval is, you can see he's less consistent in offense while still being great than Mookie Betts. But they're both, I mean, the, the main takeaway here is they're both great players and in different ways. Yeah. And, um, so this is just a great visualization because you can see where the um, where this elite classification comes from. Because for something like war, it just gives you a number and you can't really see where it's coming from. And with ToxPy, it just provides transparency where you know that JD Martinez is elite because of his hitting. And yeah, it, it just gives a great summary. So now let's look at pitchers. In case study three, in our final case study, we did a pitcher versus pitcher comparison over 2016 through 2019. And as a bonus, we threw an early Kershaw in his historically great 2012 through 2015 seasons. So I'll give you a little less time this time to look at rank order A and rank order B and see which one you would choose with the only difference being Scherzer and Verlander. So who guessed rank order B? 
you can see that we provide some different abbreviations for the different metrics we use in the bottom right. And as rank order B went, we have Kershaw coming out top, Verlander in second, and Scherzer rounding out third. And something to note here is that because of the widths being the same, we had the same weight for each of the different metrics for the tox by profiles. And this had the strongest um, correlation to war, coincidentally enough. So looking again at the unsupervised hierarchical clustering, we saw in the previous slide that early Kershaw was better than Verlander, was better than Scherzer, but Verlander and Scherzer's overlapping confidence intervals in close clustering suggests that the performance is not truly distinguishable. So long story short, let's look to the unsupervised clustering. We have Verlander and Scherzer here, and according to their ranks, we'd think, oh, Verlander is better than Scherzer. But no, because of these confidence intervals and variability in their different seasons, we can see that they're not truly, one's not necessarily better than the other. They're both on the same elite pedestal. And they're, um, they're yeah, they're at the same level. I like that. And one thing that's distinguishable is, and interesting though, is Clayton Kershaw, similar to Mike Trout, is a standout here in his 2012 to 2015 season. So let me provide some conclusions and future directions. So Toxpy is a software that's simple, but powerful, and it can be applied to MLB player performance besides just boring old toxicology. It synthesizes numerous stats in an aggregate metric, and depending on intent and stat selection, it can resemble war. And as I mentioned, it may resemble war, but it just provides a great visual and transparency as to where these statistics are coming from and what distinguishes a player over the course of multiple seasons. So these confidence intervals provide important information and essentially performance variability for these different players. So we're looking forward to hearing your feedback, how we can improve the work. And as my dad mentioned earlier, we're open to collaborating on new modeling projects at beaterinjured23 at gmail.com and sdirting at rochester.r.com. So we'd like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. All right, great. So I think we can uh, open it up to questions. Uh, you can go ahead and unmute yourself or uh, throw it in the chat if you have any. And um, I think I'll get started with the, uh, with the um, rank ordering. Is there a limit as to how many players you can include at once in that, or um, and how how much do you have to set the tiers that it sorts that Toxpy sorts it into, versus uh, Toxpy determining the tiers on its own? Do you want to answer that? Do you well, answer? I'll I'll take it on because I have a little more experience with the software, and that is really for the intended use. You know, to look at chemicals and their various potencies. Um, in, in toxicology, it really can handle hundreds, thousands of uh, different entities. So in this case, players, and it's really remarkably quick um, software. So it, it's one of those interesting things where this is highly, highly scalable. And, you know, we didn't kind of assign ranks, we didn't form clusters, that's kind of hands off, that's the computer we did make decisions around how much weight do we give which statistic. And we've already, you know, we've had some good uh, dialogue and feedback from people who would have rather seen, you know, X, Y, or Z other statistics in the model or weighted differently. And I guess um, our stock reply is that we don't claim to be subject experts. We're just trying to kind of show the sabermetrics community kind of features of this tool and invite them to explore it <laughs> with their subject knowledge. Correct me if I have this wrong, but it looked like for your average player, the outer limit for fielding and base running was much further from the origin than for hitting. Does that reflect greater variability or 
is something else or do I, did I simply misread that? Yeah, that's a great observation. It, it's, kind, it's one of those things where <clears throat> these pie wedges kind of self scale. I mean, we can have statistics that go from zero to 1.0. We can have other statistics. They have a very different dynamic range or units and the software just kind of self scales. So um, I, I don't think we should read too much into it. You know, that one projection, mm -hmm. you know, the average players uh, defense projection is a certain length versus their offense. Okay, good. thank you. Um, so it looks like we had a question in the chat. Um, based on the stats you're using, how many years back could you go? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I mean, I think Ben will, will handle that one. Yeah, so what's important to know is that because of how advanced technology like is from then, it's, it's, we're limited to how far back we can go for specific metrics. So because now the cameras are able to capture like what a player had for breakfast, it's essentially, it's much different than what they had back then. So it depends, it, it depends on the metrics we look at and we could always change the metrics to say the more simpler ones that you were able to track without these advanced um, cameras, but we would most likely have to change from the more advanced ones we were using. So, and, and I'll just lean in with kind of an an anecdote about that. I mean, I grew up like late seventies, early eighties, really being way into baseball at that time. So I wanna see what Mike Schmidt looks like versus, you know, some Arenado or something. But as Ben says, you know, we just have to pick our statistics differently because there isn't an ultimate zone rating for, you know, those older times. Um, but fun to think about going back in time and putting, you know, modern era players up against some of the old timers. Great. All right. Well, I think we can um, probably reopen it up to any general questions and uh, invite Ethan back in if anyone has any additional questions for him. Um, just in terms of a little bit of wrap up before we uh, get to our last few minutes here. Um, if you are not currently on our mailing list and want to be, uh, feel free to drop me a line. Uh, my email is rbrecker, R-B-R-E-C-K-E-R -E -E at gmail.com and uh, we'll definitely get you on our list. Uh, this session will also be up on the Sabre Videos YouTube channel uh, probably by the end of the week. So if you know of anyone um, that wasn't able to join us tonight but would be interested in seeing it, um, you can let them know to uh, take a look there um, later in the week and they can uh, catch up. Um, so we'll open it up for any uh, last questions for um, either Ethan or uh, Steve and Ben. And actually I see um, Perry Barber's joined us. Um, for anyone that um, doesn't know Perry, she's a, um, she's a real live umpire. So um, I'd be curious, Perry, what's uh, um, what's your thoughts on some of the feedback that uh, umpires can get from the umpire scorecards? Hi. So I I I'm driving. If you can't tell, I'm driving <laughs> I'm sorry, down to sorry to put you on the spot. I've got a tournament starting at ten o'clock in the morning, so I'll get home in time to get. And then head down to Jupiter. So I, I thank you for hosting this. My gosh, Ethan, I follow you on Twitter, but I'm just completely fascinated. I mean, you're you're very young. You're still in college. What compelled you to do this deep dive into umpire analysis? I, I mean, do you umpire yourself? Have you had umpire training? And um, my second half of that is once you get your program is pretty much on pilot, which it sounds like is going to happen at some point. Do you have any thoughts about expanding your uh, analysis to 
to minor league umpires or say um, Olympic baseball umpires starting in the you know whenever they start Olympic baseball? Yeah, those are uh, those are some great questions. Um, so uh, to start with the first one, you know, uh, what compelled me? I'm not really sure. I I have a I have a you know a super interesting answer. I, I read an article a couple summers ago about the prevalence of missed calls, and my first uh, my first I guess instinct was was to ask, you know, well this is how often they happen, but how much do they really matter? That's sort of the the, the overarching question that I had. And then so the, the, before I even started any of the, the analysis that I was doing now, I came up with that idea of how to measure um, the impact of a, of a missed call. So that was sort of the, the first thing that got me into this. And then, you know, I, I, at some point I just said, well, you know, maybe people would be interested to see uh, what this looks like for, you know, a specific game. And then once I started posting them online on Reddit, um, you know, people seem to enjoy them. And as a teenager who grew up with the internet, there's nothing I love more than positive feedback from, you know, the internet. So then I figured I should probably start sharing this with uh, as many people as possible. And I realized I could do that on Twitter. Uh, and then it sort of just took off and it was sort of out of my hands. I mean, for a while I was getting, you know, one like or two likes on all my tweets. And then there was wow. a game towards the end of last year where, uh, in San Francisco's game 162, whoever won the game, well, if San Francisco won, they would make the playoffs. And if they lost, they would not make the playoffs. Uh, it was it was that decisive. And the uh, and the margin of victory was less than what I said the the run impact was. And that was the first tweet that sort of went viral, you could say. Um, and wow. then so from there, it sort of just it took off. So I never really had an intention of of. Uh, of cultivating the, the following I have now, but it's it sort of a, it, it was out of my hands a little bit. Um, and then so like this- you've never question, umpired yourself or- you No, I, 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 I actually That's barely great. have, uh, I actually barely have playing experience. I played some, I played some uh, little league and t-ball when I was younger, but I've, I've watched since I was a, since I was a little kid. Um, and then, so your second question about expanding to other, other uh, like formats of baseball, I guess. The, the, the issue, uh, I mean, I would love to, I would love to. The, the, the one uh, consideration is just has to do with the, the, the accuracy of the data that exists. So even at, yeah. the ML, at the, even at the MLB level, I still encounter issues, which is part of what has kept me from fully automating the, automating the process. There's still issues in how, you know, pitches are tagged, what their location is reported as, et cetera. And from what I've read, those those problems only compound as you go down in levels. So as you go to the minor right. leagues, and I'm not even sure what the state of um, baseball analytic you know, data is, you know, for pitch tracking at right. the, uh, at, at, a, at Olympic course. baseball leagues. So yeah. you know, if there was data, it's it's not a super complicated uh, process. There are a lot of steps, but you know, each individual step is is not is not so is not so uh, difficult. So if there was the data, I would be uh, I would more I would be more than happy to expand it, but um, I'm not sure exactly exactly how uh, how feasible that is, at least in the short term. Well, thank you. I want to thank you particularly because your research basically confirms what I and a lot of umpires have suspected all along that we're really not as bad as people think we are. Yeah. So I, I appreciate your driving that point home and uh, pointing out that yeah, the accuracy rate is actually pretty good. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's been a, yeah, that's been a big aspect of it. I know that a lot of other umpire accounts online like only focus oh, yeah. on uh, oh, yeah. incorrect yeah. calls. So, so, so we missed by just like 0.003 of a millimeter. Boom, you know. Right. Yeah. So I've, I've tried to be, you know, as positive as possible. And, you know, there's, there's a section on my, on my website actually, which highlights uh, the, 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 the games on my Twitter, which are getting the most attention and more often than not, you know, two out of three of them or three out of three of them are games, which are getting a lot of attention because they were called very well and uh, not because they were called poorly. So it's been nice to bring attention to that part of the game as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Enjoyed this very much. Really appreciate it.
Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Perry. You have a, a great tournament. Yeah, thank you. All right, any last questions? All right, well, I think we can go ahead and uh, conclude the session then. Um, thank you so much, uh, Steve and Ben, for um, talking to us about uh, Cox Pine and potential applications with uh, baseball analytics. And Ethan. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. And Ethan, thanks for your great work with uh, Umpire Scorecards. And thanks for joining us um, tonight and uh, kind of walking everyone through that. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, everyone, have a good night. Um, enjoy the summer weather and uh, rest of the baseball season. Bye. Thanks, Ryan. All right. Thanks, everyone.